Before we start the talk, allow me to introduce the speaker of the day. Dato Professor Sundra Raju is the founding president of ASEAN Institute of Alternate Dispute Resolution from 2018 to date. He is also a certified international ADR practitioner for AIAD, AIADR. He is also a charter arbitrator for Chartered Institute of Arbitrator, an advocate and solicitor, architect and town planner, director for Asian International Arbitration Center, Chairman for Asian Domain Name Dispute Resolution Center, Deputy Chairman, FIFA Adjudicatory Chamber, President, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, President, Asian Pacific Regional Arbitration Group, Founding President for Society of Construction Law Malaysia, Founding President for Malaysian Society of Adjudicators, Founding President for Sports Law Association of Malaysia, Visiting and Adjunct Professors at University Technology Malaysia, University Kebangsaan Malaysia, University Science Malaysia, University of Malaya. He holds an Honorable Doctorate LLB from Leeds Beckett University. Since 1990, Dato has served as Chairman, Co-Arbitrator and Co-Arbitrator of Three Man Panel and so arbitrator in over 300 international and domestic arbitration including ad hoc and institutional arbitration administered by ICC, SIAC, HKIAC, KIAC, CIE, TEC, PCA, and KLRCA. Dr. Professor Sundar Raju has also authored, co-authored, edited several books and contributed chapters and articles on arbitration, contracts, and construction law, including UN CITRA Model Law and Arbitration Rules, the Arbitration Act 2005, amended 2011 and 2018, and the AIAC Arbitration Rules 2018-2019, Sweet and Maxwell, a practical guide to statutory adjudication in Malaysia, fourth edition 2018 and more. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Professor Sundra Raju. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, very kind, very lengthy introduction. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, it's, uh, I also thank uh, the Slango Bar for, for inviting me to, to give this talk. Uh, it is a pleasure to actually talk to speak to uh, our fellow lawyers. Uh, I've uh, rejoined the profession uh, since last year. As uh, I uh, revived my cert practicing certificate, uh, but I'm not a member of the Slango Bar. I'm a member of the KL Bar. <laughs> so, so I think it is a <laughs> great no honor that uh, the first people who actually invited me is the Slango Rians. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about actually arbitration in Malaysia, uh, how it developed uh, generally, and then I think uh, the event that was very very important. I think it, is a, it will be seen in Malaysian arbitral or dispute resolution history as one of the key events uh, will be in the two year of 2018. There were two amendments that were made to the Arbitration Act. Uh, one amendment changed the name of KLRCA, the Kuala Lumpur Regional Center for Arbitration, amendment number one, to the Asian International Arbitration Center signifying signifying the agreement of ELCO and also the ambition of the center to serve beyond Kuala Lumpur and domestically. Uh, let me start off now with, uh, I have some slides. Uh, let me uh, explain to you all. I have the full slides will be given to you, whatever I'm showing you. So you don't have to worry that you're unable to understand. And then I have also distributed articles uh, related, which are published in the MLJ relating to the development of arbitration, which are basically the talk will be based on that. And also the repeal of section 42, which is quite controversial. We will discuss this later in this talk. Uh, and then uh, I, I'm uh, also not, not I'm selling this book, but I'm also recommending 
I'm recommending uh, that that this is everything I'm talking about is in this book, uh, which is about thousand pages, explaining how the 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 law in Malaysia now X is where arbitration is concerned. Now let me start off with the first slide. Eh? Uh, before that, sorry, Dato, can you show the book again nearer to the camera? <laughs> sorry, sorry. I have to show you the. Uh, is, is yeah, it there? nearer. I, I, I can't see it. What happened? What happened? Huh? It, it is uh, the virtual. What, what is the title of the book? Oh, uh, I, I... No, no. Can you just take away the virtual thing and leave the empty behind? Yeah. Ah, there. Yeah, yeah. Let me. Yeah, let me and... I, I think uh, the virtual thing is disturbing. Huh? All uh, right. Uh, okay. Antitra model law. A model law. Uh, it was this one was published in uh, January two thousand and nineteen. Uh, it talks about the Act as it is, together with the Arbitration Rules two thousand eighteen. So uh, it is on the model law. I will explain what the model law means, what the arbitration rules mean, and then I will explain where the changes have come in, and why we are now where we are competitively uh, in in I think in Asia, Asia Pacific. We are one of the leading nations due to these amendments. Uh, so I will discuss that. Huh? So okay, okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Richard. Thank you, uh, so that's so much for the advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, you can. Don't <laughs> thank worry. You. Um, starting off with the first slide, huh? I I'll give you a little bit of background on what actually happened in, uh, in uh, Malaysia. Uh, law, arbitration law first came to Malaysia in when the British took over Malaya and they actually had their own arbitration act. They brought in their arbitration act uh, and in the straight settlement, subsequently it was applied to all over. Uh, and in 1952, we had a reverse takeover from the arbitration act 1952 enacted in Sarawak based on the English arbitration act and it was adopted for the peninsula and, uh, and also for uh, Sabah uh, in 1952. So uh, I think uh, you know, not all law is made in, uh, in, in the peninsula. I think sometimes law is made in uh, Sarawak and we adopted it and it applied for the whole of uh, Malaysia. And so for a long, long time, uh, the 1952 Act based on the Arbitration Act, English Arbitration Act 1950 was the ruling law. Uh, and it is so important to have legislation to govern arbitration. Without legislation to govern arbitration, uh, it doesn't, uh, doesn't work. So you need a, a, what we saw, we say an arbitral regime. An arbitral regime uh, is will be the law, the case law, and also the community to administer and also to act as arbitrators and to use the arbitration and lawyers are very important. But in the early days, uh, technical people were very involved because a lot of standard form contracts that have arbitration clauses were actually uh, in, issued by uh, technical institutions like the uh, Architects Institute, like for example, the, the Engineers Institute, even now I think they have a dominant role where standard form contracts are, are involved and they actually uh, contain arbitration clauses. Now, uh, the real fight for the modernity, modernity in arbitration really came up in the 90s. Uh, I like to actually go through some timelines for us. Uh, we became at independence, a member of the UN and UNCITRAL in 1957. Now in 1985, UNCITRAL, which is a UN body, releases what is called the model law, a model law for arbitration. It released a template of what a law should for be for arbitration. Uh, it was actually based on the UNCITRAL uh, arbitration rules. In 1976, it was released originally. The, the uh, arbitration uh, rules were released then. Then they found it worked. It was applied to many ad hoc arbitrations. And then the UNCITRAL actually released the model law. Uh, and then 
1958, in the meanwhile, there was in the world a convention. A convention, you know, is, uh, is that a treaty. So various uh, states rectified the treaty and this treaty was called the New York Convention on the Enforcement and Recognition, on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. Now, the Modern Law and the New York Convention are the two pillars of the international commercial arbitration regime. So if you want to be a modern society involved in international trade and global uh, uh, relationship, you must have signed the New York Convention. So arbitral awards can be enforced in your country or your arbitral awards can be enforced elsewhere because this is the very important thing. In fact, the most successful convention ever devised under human kind has been the New York Convention. At the present moment, I believe there is 166 countries who have signed the convention. That means you can actually get an arbitral award issued in Malaysia and forced in 166 countries. You cannot say that for a court order or a court judgment. Judgments have limited enforceability outside your jurisdiction. So I think that had become quite an uh, important thing. So the model law uh, is a debate that I was participating when I first got involved with the bar in the 90s and in the early 2000s, uh, where at that time, the Attorney General, I think uh, Tan Sri Mokta, he invited the bar to actually prepare legislation uh, for changing, for uh, he wanted to repeal the Arbitration Act 1952 and replace it with a new Arbitration Act of uh, fitting the, the, the times. Uh, so I think, you know, at that time the bar was involved. I remember I was a young, much younger. I mean, I didn't say I was very young, but I was, much young younger. <laughs> I was much younger. Mm -hmm. So I remember working with, uh, you know, on weekends with uh, Dr. Bill Davidson, Dr. Shankar, Dr. B, uh, Tansri VC George, uh, even Kutubul Zaman. Uh, we used to come uh, on the weekends at the old bar council uh, building uh, before we all moved into the new premises, you know, and then we used to work on the weekends to prepare it. And we came out with a proposal that was actually uh, in the late, uh, uh, it started in the early 2000 plus, I think uh, before the act. And subsequently, there was a debate that happened. Now, in England, uh, which we always look to at that time for most of our cases and our legislation, uh, had amended its Arbitration Act first 1979. From 1952, they amended it in 1979. They then amended it in 1996. Uh, and then, of course, I think they, they did some minor amendments, but the 1996 Arbitration Act is now the governing thing. So when we started work on proposing the amendment, uh, Act uh, to replace the 1952 Act, what actually happened was this debate started. Should we follow the English Arbitration Act 1996 or should we follow the model law? And the debate was very intense. In fact, because of the debate, I think the whole Act was delayed for about three, four, five years. Uh, because I think nobody could make a decision because uh, the community, arbitral community itself was divided on which should be the actual arbitration uh, model that we should choose. Uh, but nevertheless, I think the bar forged ahead. The bar submitted uh, its draft and the draft was based on the New Zealand Act. And the New Zealand Act was model law. Model law, I keep on repeating, model law is a template that is proposed by the United Nations ancestral body that for countries to use as a template to make, to pass their, to draft their uh, arbitral legislation 
and it will have the, all the major provisions so that I think the UN intended to harmonize all the arbitral regimes. And so at the present moment, we have about 80 over countries that have the model law. Uh, of course, uh, England doesn't have the model law. It has its own act. Uh, and the English act is not model law. I think that, that, that of, of course, you know, I remember Lord Mastil came here in 1999 and I was in the audience. And uh, I remember asking him the question, why did England, I was in, in England at that time in 1996 when the model law was passed, when the English act was passed. And when he came here in 1999, for those who don't know who's Lord Mastil, Lord Mastil used to be the House of Lords and he was an expert on arbitration. And he's very well known for his textbook with Stuart Boyd. He's called Mastil and Boyd on Arbitration. If you are a person, if you ask your master who, who's over 50 years old or maybe 60 years old, most probably the textbook that he used uh, or it's still maybe sitting in his, uh, in his shelf behind him, uh, it will most probably be either Mastil and Boyd and he most probably will have a Russell on arbitration. Uh, and then, uh, of course, if he, hit, uh, if he is into building construction, he will have Hudson's. So, so that is uh, the way it is uh, at that time. So Mastil was actually uh, a very eminent uh, uh, House of Lords uh, uh, judge. And he answered my question and he said, look, the English Act is got modern law provisions and it is more. So in other words, he's saying whatever provisions that have been, uh, that is in the model law, it is in the English Act. And we, they also actually uh, uh, enacted in statute all their common law precedents. But I think the important thing is that uh, it is generally accepted in the international community, arbitral community that England is not a model law country. But uh, I think the more important thing he said, what are the model law countries that are important to us? I think the first model law country that is important to us, I mean, nearby is Singapore, all the Southeast Asian countries, except for Indonesia, I think is having model law. Uh, I think China is having model law. Uh, India is having model law, the 1996 Arbitration and Conciliation Act. Most of the European countries and, uh, and states, you know, because uh, arbitration statutes in the United States is actually uh, done by the states and some states in the United States have model law. So generally, I think 80 something countries have committed to model law, whereas I think a number of countries have not committed to model law. Now the model law from time to time, UNCITRAL does amendments, they update the law. They update their, their template. So in 1985, they came out with model law. Then they did a revision in 2006. Now, when we actually came out with our act in 2005, that is our Arbitration Act 19, uh, 2005, repealing the 1952 act, we unfortunately just fell behind when UNCITRAL, the next year, issued a set of amendments to the model law. So we didn't catch those amendments on time. So, um, so what we had was in 2005, uh, the act that we enacted generally followed model law with some uh, in-house drafting and styles. And I will discuss all these things afterwards, uh, but it was basically based on the 1985 uh, template. And we, I think we just followed the New Zealand Act of opting in and opting out because the Act has two parts, the international part and the domestic part. And basically we said certain parts are common to both domestic and international. For one part, you have to opt in or you have to opt out. So I think uh, the New Zealand model was that. And, uh, and hence, uh, in 2006, when the revision came, uh, it was out of date. But nevertheless, it was a great achievement. In 2005, Malaysia became a model law country. And I think if you go back and check 
uh, we actually had tremendous growth in trade and other things at that time also. Uh, I became the director of the of then the Regional Center for Arbitration in 2010. And uh, in 2010, uh, the name changed to the Kuala Lumpur Regional Center for Arbitration. Uh, and it's a, it is important that one of the uh, quick tasks that I had to do as director is to try to have amendments uh, quickly made to, to the Arbitration Act to bring it at least for temporarily to deal with certain issues. For example, there was an issue of uh, interim measures or enforcement of awards uh, in support of a foreign arbitration. Uh, there was actually also the issue of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 domestic arbitrations are treated differently from international arbitrations, uh, which seemed to be an anomaly uh, in the way that that in domestic arbitrations, you can only apply Malaysian law, whereas in international arbitrations, you are allowed to apply uh, any other law, I think section 30, but I think we decided that it should be, both parties should have the advantage of choosing the law they want, because in court, the court can decide according to any law, not only Malaysian law. Uh, so, so we thought that, you know, there must be an advantage there uh, to do that. So I think that time the, 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 the AG uh, was Tansi Ghani and he was very supportive and we got our amendment 2011. It was just a stopgap amendment. Uh, in 2013, Alco continued uh, its, uh, its, uh, its host country agreement to keep uh, KLRCA as, uh, as an Alco center. And in 2017, something happened. As lawyers, we know that um, uh, the most important decisions affecting the law, interpreting, interpreting the law, and also determining what the law is, actually is from the federal court. And the federal court in 2017 came out with a decision in Far East Holdings versus Majlis Agama Islam and Adat Reza Malayu Pahang, and that start, started off a chain reaction. And I think the best chain reaction to explain it is best explained by the letter by the president of the bar to the minister at the time. Uh, the minister at the time, the letter is dated 23rd November 2017. You know, actually legislation change in Malaysia is tough. It is not easy to change legislation because the government has a number of legislation it wants to pass. And you know, it will, it will actually, that will take priority. And if you think that you need to actually pass or make some amendments or whatever it is, you will have to wait in queue and you have to persuade the minister who are the politicians and the agencies, including AG, uh, AGC, to allow the amendments to be done. Because at the end of it, all law is drafted by AGC. Uh, uh, you can make the proposal, but it has to go to AGC, it has to go before cabinet, cabinet has to approve, then it has to be laid before parliament, there has to be a debate, then it's passed, then it goes to the uh, parliament, it consists of two houses, and then uh, it has to go to the Senate. So I, I, I think, you know, normally uh, it is not easy to change law. But in this particular instance, the Bar Council actually wrote to the minister in, you know, on, in, on the 23rd of November. And the president at that time, who's now a judicial commissioner, uh, Vergis George, wrote this letter. And let me read, uh, uh, just go through the letter quickly with you all, because this was the impetus. Can we start from the beginning? Okay, we refer to the recent decision of the federal court in the Far East Holdings another. We have already read that. Then it talks about the judgment, the letter. This is addressed to the minister at the time, huh, who was the minister in charge of law. Um, next, uh, it says that, the letter says that uh, first, uh, it, it held that under the 2005 Act, the federal court in 187 of its paragraph of its decision held that section 33.6 removed the power of the arbitral tribunal to grant pre-award interest. 
I think that was a shock to a lot of people because it was 40 years of law established as a common law principle, although the, uh, the 1952 Act was silent about pre-award interest. There was sufficient uh, case law until the Court of Appeal saying that the arbitral tribunal can issue pre-award interest. Now the court, the federal court ruled that an arbitral tribunal cannot award pre-award interest. What is pre-award interest? Pre-award interest is the interest that is payable on a sum that is awarded from the cause of action until the date of the award. See, sometimes, you know, when, when the case actually first, the cause of action starts, let's say there is a termination or there's some breach, the cause of action starts from there. It will be many years before the decision comes out. So the, the, the courts do give pre-award a uh, pre-judgment interest. But now what the federal court said, uh, according to our reading of section 33.6, the arbitral tribunal has no power because it's silent. I think that sent a shock. Everybody was stunned because there's no reason for anybody to do arbitration because it is a great disadvantage to do any arbitration because there is no chance you will get uh, uh, pre-award interest. I remember when the decision came out, I was director of the center. Uh, and then at that moment, I think uh, there, there, were, there, there were awards and basically the awards had to omit uh, pre-award interest. And some of them were considerable sums of money. You know? uh, so it affected uh, basically the position of, the, of, the, of, of, of Malaysia being a safe seat. Now, the second thing, in paragraph 123 and 150, it talks about section 42. Now, what is section 42? Now, section 42 uh, under the Arbitration Act 2005 was there was a possibility that, that a party can refer questions of law after the award is published for the decision of the court. I've written this in great detail afterwards, I'll go in again. Now, basically, uh, in most other jurisdictions, there's only two other countries, uh, maybe three, that still have this provision. One is England, uh, which uh, they have a threshold test. Uh, there's a leave provision that prefaces before you can start the action. Singapore, also the same, and New Zealand. All the rest of the places don't have it. So, but unfortunately, uh, I mean, I don't say the federal court is wrong. Federal court, I think, was right in its literal reading. Although the the I think the courts try very valiantly uh, to uh, to maintain earlier the the sustainability of section forty two. The problem really become became this uh, because there was no leaf provision, which was which was originally proposed in the bar draft, which was removed based on the NIMA and Antoyo's guidelines, uh, which the Court of Appeal and the House of Lords had already uh, 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 devised for leave questions. This was not actually enacted in, in, in the 2005 Act. It was removed. I, we don't know why it was removed. Uh, therefore, there was no leave provision so I think the, the, this became a fertile ground for litigation. So every time an award comes out, particularly in a, it is for domestic arbitration, because there's a differentiation by international and domestic, the award was challenged. So there was no finality. So it was challenged from, I mean, from the arbitral award, the arbitral, I mean, essentially uh, it became like the court. The arbitral tribunal became an inferior tribunal, uh, which then you appeal to the High Court, after which under Section 42, after which you appeal to the Court of Appeal, after which you appeal to the Federal Court, and the decision of the Federal Court will be final. So what's the difference? Because uh, you have arbitration is supposed to be independent uh, and, and, and running parallel, and they're supposed to be finality, so that people can choose uh, for a technical or all the advantages of arbitration they have, a specialist tribunal, 
they have uh, they they want to have it in in confidence uh, they want to actually enforce it overseas uh, uh, and all the other reasons so suddenly it just got into the court system uh, and i believe that the bar got a bit nervous because basically it meant that there is no more finality to arbitral awards and if we go to the next page uh, and I, I want to go how did the bar ask us on this basically they said that the decision will seriously undermine the attractiveness of malaysia as a destination for arbitration we, of course re, uh, we are reminded of the competition uh, between jurisdictions globally for all the arbitration cases so uh, and the bar council also anticipates the foreign and domestic investors will regard this as a competitive disadvantage for malaysia to use it as an investment destination and will regard arbitration in Malaysia as unattractive. And therefore, they, they express support. The Bar Council urged the government to expeditiously rectify the problems caused by this decision. We respectfully urge for immediate amendment of Section 33.6 to restore the powers of arbitrators to award interest in line with the Malaysian courts pursuant to Section 11 of the Civil Law Act, which is pre-judgment uh, pre interest rates. And in addition to this, we support an urgent reconsideration and reversal of the expensive powers assumed by the Malaysian courts to intervene in arbitral awards or to repeal Sections 42 and 43 of the Arbitration Act. This is how the amendments to the, 2000, uh, the 2018 amendments started. It started from a letter from the Bar Council based on the decision of the Federal Court. And it was actually addressed to the, to the, to the, to the minister and copied, uh, I think, to me at that time. Uh, go down, is it? Can it go down further? No, cannot. Okay. It was copied to me. This letter was copied to me. That's why, hence, I have a copy of this. Uh, and I think the important thing is that uh, after that, the center was called up by the minister. And we were directed to actually start doing the amendments and do a rushed amendments. And at that time in November uh, and early December, parliament was sitting. And when parliament was sitting, we rushed the two amendments in. One is to repeal section 42 and the other one is to put in the pre-award interest by way of a cabinet note. Uh, the cabinet note went in, the uh, minister agreed and she presented the note, it was approved. But uh, at that point of time, AGC advised that this will not be legal and that we have to do a full uh, uh, cabinet memoranda. Uh, and uh, so basically, uh, it was uh, back to the drawing booth. So the next sitting was in February. So I think the minister actually uh, directed uh, the various stakeholders, including the center to coordinate and get the amendments done. Uh, at that point of time, the government also decided that it should follow the latest ancestral amendments in 2006. So that we will and also do more things uh, in uh, uh, to improve the, the 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 position of Malaysia and the center and arbitration as a whole, uh, so that it will become an attractive uh, destination for not only arbitration but also for investment, so that people can resolve the disputes. So uh, you know things become and we have the latest and the best law that is possible by looking at all the amendments. So uh, the 2018 amendments were then actually prepared by the center. It was then we had a stakeholders meeting. It was discussed and uh, it was uh, organized by a consultant uh, uh, managing that various, all the stakeholders were invited from AGC to to bar council, to various uh, people, and most of them attended. And then uh, the various, they were broke up into caucuses to discuss various amendments, and they all came back together. And the, the general, in fact, it was almost a unanimous, in fact, I don't see anybody objecting to the amendments. 
everybody amended, everybody agreed that the amendments must go through. Uh, and then they said it can be now put to the government. So this was then put to the government with the amended act, with the, all the provisions done. So uh, when the proposal was put in, one of the things that was also put in at that time, which was never accepted by uh, particularly AGC, uh, because I don't think so, uh, we were ready for it, was third party funding. Uh, at that time, third party funding was already enacted in Singapore, in England, and in, uh, in, uh, in Hong Kong. So if we had put in third party funding at that time, we would have come up, that means our act would have been the latest having that. But uh, unfortunately, we didn't get it. And uh, I, I, I was told that if we wanted that, then these, these amendments will not go through because uh, this has to be debated further and we decided to leave that up. So that's why there is no third party funding. If you, if you ask me, for those who don't know what third party funding is, it involves, uh, you see, uh, England and most of the developed countries, including Australia, uh, uh, common law. And then, uh, uh, and I think we are one of the anomalies in the common law world. They will still have the rule on maintenance and champerty. Maintenance and champerty, that means you cannot do contingency fee charging. Now, third party funding basically means uh, somebody can finance the arbitration. We are not talking about litigation funding. Eh? We are talking about third party funding for arbitration. Uh, so it's a bit different from uh, litigation. Uh, but I think now Hong Kong is going to bring in third party funding for litigation. It's all about access to justice whether you want to allow, allow access to justice because some people may be insolvent, impecunious, they cannot actually afford to go on with the arbitration or in, let's say in Hong Kong, they're talking about litigation, arbitration and litigation. So they can get a third party to actually help them. But there are certain safeguards that are put in, including disclosure requirements and also ability for cost orders to be issued against the funder because the funder is the actual person who's carrying the risk. So he must be, the, because the party itself doesn't have money. So I think uh, that has not happened. I, I believe it will happen one day, maybe in somebody else's watch. It's, I, I think it's time to do it. We are behind time. Everybody else is doing it. If we want to be a safe seat, we have to do. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there were two amendments made in 2018. The first amendment is amendment Arbitration Amendment Number One Act 2018. It was to change the name from KLRCA to AIAC because uh, I think Alco has committed that there will not be another Alco Center in Asia Pacific, and we will be the sole center, so we can change our name to cover. And in return, I think the center and the Malaysian government committed that it will actually. Uh, uh, make sure that we are adequately resourced and we are able to actually serve uh, the, 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 the Asia Pacific. I think we were also eyeing at that time the Belt and Road. Uh, we had uh, 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 an agreement with uh, uh, in various stages of agreement uh, with the Chinese government to actually be the hub outside of China for the Belt and Road. But I think that did not happen because of uh, consequentially there were some events that actually brought it to an end. So I think after that, I think Alco has now issued a center in China uh, in, uh, uh, I think in 2019, they issued a center in China, which is now I think uh, being set up. So there is another Alco center in Asia. So, but anyway, we are fortunate. We still have our name, Asian International Arbitration Center. Uh, shows our ambition. Now, let me talk about why we need the 2018 amendments. Now, the first reason is to keep with the revisions of the ancestral model law. I think that is quite straightforward because that was the 2006 revision. As I said, when we passed our act in 2005, in 2006, ancestral provided revisions and all the model law countries started to use it, including Singapore and Hong Kong. We're always looking at Singapore and Hong Kong because they are our main uh, countries that are useful to emulate. In fact, they have gone very far 
and uh, I won't say they are competitors, but I think they are good examples for us so that we, when we strike out on our own, our law is as equally good. Uh, and, uh, and the next thing is to make sure that Malaysia's global and regional competitiveness uh, is, uh, is there. Because if our neighbors have changed and we are, let's say they have changed to a Ferrari and we are still drive, driving an old pickup truck. So I think we may have a problem. You know? So we need to do that. Uh, and then I believe at that time uh, we were going through a phase where there was actually a great emphasis on uh, we wanted to be the hub. We wanted, we really believed that we wanted to be an arbitration destination. We wanted to be an arbitration hub. This is what India is now talking about. Singapore has already done it. They got a thousand over cases. They have almost overtaken ICC. Hong Kong is there, still pushing despite all the difficulties it's having. But I think a lot of people are, it's just like the Malaysian airlines or all the countries, you must have an arbitration center or you must have a national airline. And then you try to actually promote the airline so that you can fly with it, it can, it can bring you up. And so that is the destination. Uh, the next idea was to make us a competitive seat again. Uh, and I, here, I think the element of competition comes in. We wanted to be a viable uh, competitor to Hong Kong and Singapore. Reason being, we are a bigger country. We are centrally located. We have flights in and flights out. We have fantastic manpower highly trained people we have we speak english our court system is good and let me then go on to talk about um, so the amendments what did we try to do with the amendment the amendments were actually to ensure that dispute resolution mechanisms were complement each other at that point of time we had already statutory adjudication in malaysia we were one of the five countries in the world with statutory adjudication and statutory adjudication giving a temporary uh, com, uh, in the construction industry, giving a temporary uh, solution for payment problems, temporary uh, enforcement decision, enforceable decision for uh, uh, construction payment problems. So uh, we thought that with a good arbitration act, that will actually help to uh, complete the thing instead of running to the courts all the time. Because I think one of the problems now after with the view esteem case again in the federal court. Uh, uh, and I think the courts have been struggling to actually suppress the element of appeal going up to the federal court for adjudication. Because adjudication is supposed to be quick, summary in basis, but if you end up in the courts from uh, level one high court after the adjudication, uh, adju adju adjudicator has made the decision, then it goes to the High Court, it goes to the Court of Appeal, it goes to the Federal Court. I think then we have a, a lot of uh, problems. Uh, okay, I think that's one. I just want to show where we were at that time. When we started in 2010, the center had only about 22 cases in 2010. And in 2010, 22 cases is, I think most of the cases were outside the center. They were also going outside the country maybe to Singapore, to Hong Kong, to ICC, uh, that you cannot stop because uh, parties, it is party autonomy. And then I think we rewent uh, the center in 1952. But whenever I talk about these figures, always remember whatever figures that are in the center doesn't mean there is no cases outside the center. There are cases actually in PAM, Tertubuan Architect Malaysia. There are cases in IEM, Institute Engineers Malaysia, then even maybe ISM, then you may have Poran, then you have various other institutions, and there is a load of ad hoc cases, not administered. So then I always say, whatever figures that you see in the center, there may be two times the cases outside. So the plan is that if you have 150 cases, that means there are most probably 500 cases floating around every year outside. Uh, so, uh, you know, and where are they going? Where are they going? Are they going to Singapore? Are they being done ad hoc? Are they being done by various institutions? So I think one of the things that happened from 2010 uh, with the 2005 Act, 
there was a phenomenal increase in arbitration cases in the center because that's the only statistics we have because we don't have holistic statistics for the entire system i think we should have somebody collecting like adjudication we know because there's one stop everybody collects the adjudication statistics and we know that these are the total number of adjudication cases in malaysia arbitration we don't know so i think we were hovering from 22 to about 100 to 150 and i think if we had maintained and we have not disrupted the system we would have about let's say 300 cases this is my feeling you know my, my own reading of it and depends how if we did new alliances we may have got 300 cases in the center but that one is i think uh, is speculation we won't know until it is uh, done so the amendments are important to boost the economy you have to change the slide now. Uh, to increase the number of international cases and also domestic cases we need to, uh, okay, I'm sorry, you know, now there is 109 jurisdictions that have adopted the ancestral model law. And four, to become a safe seat. And what is a safe seat? You see, safe seat means, because in 2015, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators came out with what is called the London Centenary Principles 2015. And they set out 10 principles for any jurisdiction to be a safe seat. Safe seat meaning, for arbitration. First, you must have, ah, they start off with the law. You must have a modern international arbitration law. This is what the 2018 amendment is about. Then second, we have that a competent and independent judiciary with experience in international arbitration. We have what is called the construction courts. We have now specialized panels in the court of, court of appeal who will listen to arbitration and construction matters. And then I think some of the federal court judges have become very experienced. Now we have the bar, an independent and competent legal profession with experience in international arbitration. There is some experience, but I don't think so. There is a lot because the, 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 the actual international arbitration will have to be, you must have a lot of international arbitration in Malaysia because many of the parties may not appoint you to go out. Uh, if they do appoint you to go out to Singapore or whatever it is, they may, uh, it may be because it's a Malaysian party, but likely for a foreign party to appoint a Malaysian firm to do a, their own arbitration in a foreign country may be very rare. But uh, I think uh, we need to create that because we are having people, especially from the UK, who are just traveling all over the world, just appearing in arbitration, representing an arbitration. Now, the second thing is that the, uh, the fourth thing is continuing education of the legal fraternity, judiciary, law students as regard. This is one of the things we are doing now. Today, we're having this discussion. Uh, this is part of the education. And then the parties have a right to legal representative. I mean, everybody has a right to legal representative. We know that's a constitutional right here. Uh, but, you know, in Malaysia, there's restrictions. But where arbitration is concerned, uh, the Legal Profession Act has been amended, I believe, in 2015 or 14, uh, to allow uh, a free access of lawyers or any kind of representation into for arbitration in Malaysia. But they cannot go to court. Huh? They cannot go to court. There's no rights of audience before, uh, before the judiciary. There is only rights of audience before an arbitral tribunal seated in Malaysia. Uh, so I think that is one. Then uh, the other thing is that uh, number six is safe and easy accessibility. The location of Malaysia is perfect for that. You, you people can fly in, can fly out. Then do we have facilities and access to the services? We have the facilities. We have one of the best arbitration buildings in the world. We have, uh, we have the best infrastructure that is possible. Uh, only thing we need to use it. And then uh, uh, the, the existence of a code of ethics for arbitrators, I think there is, and for counsel, there is that. And then enforceability assurances through international agreements. These international agreements and enforceability for recognition and enforcement of awards, we are a signatory to the New York Convention. So that is done. And then protection or immunity granted to arbitrators for acts done as an arbitrator. We have that. 
we have that in the arbitration act we also have that in the adjudication act uh, we have that in the alco statutes uh, inviolability of the of the of the alco uh, agreement with malaysia inviolability of the building and also of the officers huh? so uh, that is the thing now let me start with the amendments itself okay um, i want to actually talk about some of the amendment the key amendments there are few that happen uh, first is emergency arbitrator and orders granted by the emergency arbitrator under section 2 and section a new section 19h that means emergency arbitrator orders and awards are enforceable so there is a recognition there's such a thing called an emergency arbitrator an emergency arbitrator normally will give interim uh, measures orders procedural orders before the arbitral tribunal is constituted and so that uh, they don't have to go to the court then the second thing is the choice of representation uh, i will explain that in further section 3a then we have the arbitral powers in deciding uh 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 the arbitrary courts powers in deciding the arbitrability of the uh, of the dispute and then uh, number 4 is arbitration agreements now can use modern techniques including electronic means section 9 then interim measures uh this is very important interim measures the power that is now given to the arbitral tribunal is the same as anywhere in the world so i think that is very important then next one uh the rules of law that are applicable that is when you choose an arbitration you can choose what rules and law that you want to apply so you don't have to choose malaysian law you can choose the best law that you want and the arbitral tribunal must decide in accordance to it there is also the rules of equity conscious uh is basically all arbitrators as a rule must decide in accordance to the law unless it is expressly provided they can decide in accordance to equity or conscience equity why do we say there is such a thing called uh, lex mercantoria and there is also the idea that let's say uh, you know a quality of the fish in a market will not decide be a decision according to the law it will be decision according to how the conduct people conduct themselves to say what is a good fish so it is a, you know so parties can say that we want to use uh, our business uh, procedures for you to decide whether this award this thing should be done in accordance to that that's what actually the rules of law equity and conscience is about so i think the 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 powers of the arbitral tribunal and the ability of the parties uh, to do this have increased are uh, the problem that was originally caused the arbitral power to award pre award and post award interest that has there been dealt with now one very important thing that was put in is one of the great emphasis now especially in commercial international commercial arbitration and also domestic arbitration is confidentiality of the arbitration and arbitration related court proceedings so a new section 41a and 41b uh, is put in actually uh, in the default rule where arbitration matters are coming before the court it should be heard in camera i don't think so many people know about it because i don't think so a lot of people have read it uh, and uh, and it can only be heard otherwise if the parties apply for it or the court itself declares that it will carry it not in camera so i think you know we will look at that and this is the law in malaysia now it ties back with all the law in various other countries including singapore and hong kong uh, and then uh, another problem which the bar asked to repeal minimum court intervention and finality of arbitration awards repeal of section 42 and 43 this is in a nutshell the main amendments that were made now i just want to go through the arbitration act you know for 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 people who have not familiar with arbitration i would advise you is to just read the arbitration act and you will suddenly know how an arbitration is conducted because the arbitration act actually tells you chronologically how the arbitration works so let us start with the arbitration act 2005 and compare it to the model law 
it all starts with uh, in our place is that we have four parts and 51 sections and then we will move on it is similar to model law i will just show you all so that you can get a feel of how the thing uh, the act is uh, uh, is structured first thing you have a short title and you have commencement Then there is an interpretation section. There is applications and awards in Malaysia. Then there is a new 3A representation. Then there is section four, arbitrability of the subject area. And it also says section five, government to be bound. So you already got an overview. Huh? First, the act says this is an act to apply to all arbitrations in Malaysia. Uh, and then they, they, they will define all the terms, arbitral tribunal, court, uh, uh, emergency arbitrator, you know, all uh, various terms. It's all in the interpretation section. And then they say how it applies. Then they, we have a new section called representation and arbitrability of the subject matter and government to be bound. Then you go to the next one. All arbitrations start with an agreement. It's a consensual method parties must have an agreement to arbitrate. Very rarely it is imposed by statute. There are statutory arbitrations, but it is very rare. Felda Act is one of them, but it will also fall under the Arbitration Act. So all the arbitration, first thing is that, what is the arbitration agreement? What form and definition is it? Then, uh, can, can go back, please. Uh, then you have the arbitration agreement and substantial claim before the court, section 10, arbitration, and interim measures. These are the interim measures that the court will give in support of the arbitration. I just want to give you all an overview eh, of how the act works. Eh? Then move on. I'm not looking at the model law because what, what I'm putting there next to the model law is how it repeats. It is following the model law. For most of the provisions we have, many of it, the model law has the thing. That means ours is a model law uh, act. Then we have number of arbitrators. It can be one or three. How are they appointed? Again, the appointment could be by the parties. It could be by a designated appointment, the default appointing authority in Malaysia. If you cannot agree on the appointment of arbitrators will be the director of AIAC. Then if an arbitrator you, is impartial or justifiable doubts about his partiality and independence and lack of qualification, what are the grounds of challenge? And then what is the challenge procedure? Challenge means basically you say that you ask the person to recuse. So you can challenge the arbitrator and it must be normally 15 days from the, the ground arises. Then what if the arbitrator fails or he cannot act, he's sick, he's dead, or he's, uh, he, he resigns, you know, not, uh, you know, he just, uh, he doesn't want to act anymore. So section 16 provides for that. Section 17, when such an event, when there is like a vacancy, how is the appointment done? Normally following the, the original procedure. Then very important thing. This is what the model law has that the old act didn't have. Competence, competence. Competence of the arbitral tribunal to rule on its own jurisdiction. You can come and say, okay, arbitral tribunal, the contract is void. You're, you cannot act as arbitrator. We want you to rule that you cannot be an arbitrator or dictate or you cannot decide on this. The arbitral tribunal can say that, look, I have a right to decide whether I have jurisdiction or not. This is a very powerful tool called competence, competence, the doctrine of competence, competence. Then section 19, the power, uh, this has been amended tremendously. Now, the Malaysian Act provides for the arbitral tribunal to issue interim measures. And the interim measures are white. Whatever the courts can give, the arbitral tribunal can give. So I think we will go through that in greater detail. And then they actually set out very, very clearly uh, the American Sinomite provisions, actually. If you look at it, the American Sinomite provisions are all there. Conditions for getting a, a granting an interim measure, application for preliminary order, or conditions for granting a preliminary order. These are all new provisions. Huh? Specific regime for preliminary orders, modification, suspension. You can terminate the interim uh, uh, interim measure order. 
uh, then uh, uh, provision you can the court can ask or you can ask for provision to, for security and there must be proper disclosure costs and damages recognition and enforcement grounds for refusing recognition for enforcement and then court ordered interim measures so you can see it is now tying back completely with the model law 2006 next one then we go back again how does the arbitration procedure work parties must be treated equally and given reasonable opportunity to present their case then determination of the rules of procedure when there is no rules of procedure who makes the rules of procedure arbitral tribunal but the parties can agree to the rules of procedure or any rules the arbitral tribunal is bound then seat of arbitration very important seat of arbitration is where you will make the applications to set aside the award uh, to get the orders for interim support and all these things it is the seat of arbitration so if it's in malaysia they will go to the malaysian court and that's why you know a lot of competition is to get the arbitration seated in malaysia so that malaysian courts can decide and then there will be more work for malaysian lawyers you know all these kind of things eh? uh, then then we go into the chronological arrangement of how the commencement of the arbitration how do you start an arbitration proceeding 24 language one of the most powerful thing about arbitration you can choose the language you want to have it if it's chinese parties they want to have an arbitration in chinese the proceedings must be conducted in chinese the arbitration award must be given in chinese i have done chinese arbitrations in in china ctec everything is in chinese in arabic in all any other language you can that is the advantage of choosing but most of the time people choose english uh, but the people choose french they may have even two languages it depends on the parties so let's say parties are having two different nations two, two major languages let's say arabic and and china they may choose english or they may choose French, uh, whichever they want. And the arbitral tribunal is bound. Uh, and arrangements must be made if the person translations to be provided, if the person is not conversant. Uh, there could be a qualification requirement for the arbitrators put in, in during the appointment of uh, the challenge procedure itself in that part. Then you have statements of claim, statements of defense, how hearings are held, what happens when a party default, a claimant defaults, the, 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 the respondent defaults, or both parties default, what happens? And then arbitral tribunal appointed by the arbitral, no, the arbitral, the expert, the expert that is appointed by the arbitral uh, tribunal. Next one is court assistance for taking evidence, because sometimes you need to take evidence from uh, parties and uh, you, you order the evidence to be taken, the court can provide, let's say, to issue a subpoena. Uh, and not only Malaysian court, but also overseas courts. Eh? So if you have the model law, you can apply to that. Uh, I can issue an order here, and then that order will be converted in overseas to serve on the, on the witness. Eh? Next one. Then this is an amendment again, law applicable to the substance of the dispute. Uh, uh, the rules of law, then how is decision making by the panel or arbitrator? Sometimes you have one or three, uh, very rarely you have five, but when you have three, majority decision rules. Uh, it, it is the thing. Then what if there's a settlement? How do you actually deal with the settlement and it talks about agreed awards? Then form uh, and contents of the award. What must an award have to make it minimum, minimum requirements to make it enforceable. Then when can the arbitration, arbitration proce uh, proceedings be terminated? And then when you come out with an award, let's say you, the arbitral tribunal has not dealt with any matter or has omitted to do it, it can be asked to actually correct the award. It has made a mistake. It could be actually also, let's say, a correction on the sleep rule. That means you've got computational errors. You added up, it became wrong because we sometimes we deal with a lot of figures. That's a sleep rule. So you can actually amend that for typos, grammar, and also uh, clerical errors. And then sometimes parties say that you have not, because there's a requirement to write, uh, give reasons for your, for your award. And if you don't write the thing clearly, they may ask you to interpret the award. 
And that also includes an additional award, as I say, that we have missed out something or you need to, to deal with something. You're supposed to deal with that thing because an arbitral tribunal, unlike the court, must deal with all matters submitted to it in the pleadings, in the submissions, in the reference to arbitration. You cannot say this matter is determinative of the dispute. I therefore only decide this. You must decide each and every matter. And then the last one is that, of course, this is not in the model law. It says an award is final and binding. Of course, an award is final and binding, subject to the provisions of annulling it under the Act, setting aside or enforcing it under the Act. Next one, recourse. Uh, I think you have to go. Cool. Recourse, is it? Okay, uh, chapter seven. Okay, chapter seven, 37 is setting aside of the award. This is very important because this becomes very important because section 42 is now uh, deleted. That this is the only provision there is to deal with if you are not happy with the award uh, to set aside. Most of it deals with jurisdictional issue, constitution of the tribunal, uh, breach of natural justice, public policy. Uh, and then uh, you have... Mm, there is no error on the face of the award. Okay, I got to move faster, I've been told. Uh, then uh, uh, there is consolidation of provisions and concurrent hearings. Consolidation can only be done with the express uh, agreement of the parties. Sometimes there are two disputes that are similar. You may want to hear it together, consolidate it. In the courts, they can order it, but the arbitral tribunal doesn't have this power. It can only order it when parties expressly agree. And then section 41 remains. Eh? Section 41 remains determination of a preliminary point of law by the court. Uh, that means uh, you can, parties and the arbitral tribunal can say this matter, we want the court to actually make a ruling after which we will then take it from there. Uh, so, but there must be complete agreement between the tribunal and the parties. The next one, which is new, 41A, 41B, I told you all, the confidentiality provisions. Disclosure of information to arbitral tribunals and awards are prohibited. And then proceedings to be heard otherwise than in open court. That means it must be heard in camera. The court then decides whether it wants to hear it uh, in, uh, in uh, open court. Then how is costs and expenses of an arbitration dealt with? Then extension of time, let's say you are out of time. Uh, that there is a provision in the arbitration agreement says that you must file it within this period and you're out of time. Uh, then you can actually ask for an extension of time from the court. Uh, and then, and some nowadays it's quite common for the rules to actually provide and even our parties to say that you must come out with the award within let's say three months after the final submission is completed. So I think I, if that is not done, there is a provision for extension of time to go to the court. Now the miscellaneous provisions are not in the model law. They include liability of the arbitrator. Arbitrators have immunity for, for their work as an arbitrator, just like judges. They cannot be sued for making a wrong decision unless it was in bad faith, mela fide. The immunity of arbitral institutions also are similar, that as long as they have acted in good faith, they appointed the person in good faith, uh, they cannot be actually taken to account. Uh, bankruptcy uh, is, I think, quite clear, you know, the, the disqualification. Uh, and then the mode of application is, uh, is under the High Court rules. It says which part of the rules and then repeal. It repealed the entire 1952 Act and also the um, common law. And I think uh, we have missed out uh, recognition and, uh, and, and, and earlier, 38 and 39. It's not there. Lah. It's okay, okay. We have missed out that. <laughs> okay. All right then. Okay, I've, I've covered now. Let's go to the first change. Huh? Okay, section two, emergency arbitrator. What is an emergency arbitrator? You see, uh, emergency arbitrator is actually something that has been around for 10 years. 10 years, 
or earlier, 15 years. The first time I saw an emergency arbitrator provision was in the ICC rules. Now, most arbitral institutions have emergency arbitrator provisions and most, many of the modern acts have emergency, they recognize emergency arbitrator. I'm writing a book on India, Indian arbitration law. The Supreme Court just recognized that an emergency arbitrator's award is enforceable. So that is a big uh, boost for emergency arbitrator and arbitration in India. But in Malaysia, we did not have this until this amendment in 2018. Whatever we had was contractual in nature. So if you would accepted the emergency arbitrator provisions under the AIAC uh, rules, uh, it was just contractual arrangement. There was no provision in the law to enforce it. The major change here is emergency arbitrators have now been defined as they fall under the definition of an arbitral tribunal. So whatever orders and awards they give has the same status. An arbitral tribunal section two means an emergency arbitrator, a sole arbitrator or a panel of arbitrators. So emergency arbitrator now in our regime is recognized as an arbitrator. Okay, then basically I think this is very important because it does not affect the jurisdiction of the courts. It just preserves the jurisdiction and enforceability of matters dealt with by an emergency arbitrator. Next one. Now we have orders and awards given by emergency arbitrator. The new section 19. The new section 19 says that the act recognizes that the orders and, and awards given by emergency arbitrator can be enforced. So I think this, uh, if you, you can read this later, but I'm not going to go because I'm just told I got 50 minutes left. I didn't realize it was, I thought I cannot do two hours. <laughs> so basically it is in line with the model law. And I think we are up to date with what is going on in the region and also in the, in around the world. So we have considered uh, uh, the, the, how the system works. And then it also deals with recognition and enforcement of interim measures by the courts, not only domestically, but also for foreign jurisdiction. So emergency arbitration and foreign uh, interim uh, jurisdictions will be actually recognized in Malaysia. That means arbitral awards giving it in Singapore, uh, that order will be recognized under our act here. So it becomes, it, you know what it becomes, it becomes a network. We are all linked with this one system working like, you know, uh, together. So I think that is very important because business doesn't stop at the border. It goes beyond the borders and it crosses many borders. So we need to have that seamless arrangement. They can choose where the award is to, where the arbitral tribunal is going to say, where they're going to go, it will be enforced anywhere. There's nowhere to hide if you break the law and you don't follow the contractual provisions. I think for business people is very, very good. Now the second, the other thing is about uh, tribunal, choice of representation. Uh, it's very, very interesting that uh, this problem of representation, people confuse it with representation before the court. I think quite clear for us to be, for a, a client or a party to be represented in court, you must be called to the bar and you must have a practicing certificate, which means you have a rights of audience. In arbitration, there is no provision because why? There will be lawyers and representatives from different jurisdiction. So you cannot have a restriction saying that if I sit it here, it must be a, a Malaysian lawyer who can appear. So you, you know, parties will insist that I want to bring my own lawyers, you know. I, I, let's say I'm Shell. I don't want to use uh, uh, Malaysian lawyers. I, I give you an example there. You know, the Petronas uh, arbitration with uh, Shell, uh, they use Dutch lawyers. You know, so if, they, if we had said that uh, we don't allow representation in, in arbitration, uh, most probably the arbitration will not be seated in Malaysia. You can choose anybody you want. It is not restricted. Now, we had a problem in Sabah uh, because the Sabah Advocates Ordinance 
said that in Saba, only lawyers can represent. I mean, the interpretation under the case of uh, Samsuri versus Samsuri bin Baharudin versus Muhammad Azari, Azahari bin uh, uh, Matlasin uh, basically said, uh, I think it was a ruling by, by the former uh, uh, now who became CJSS, which is correct, I think. I believe it's correct. That's why it has to be amended by law. Uh, is that the Sabah ordinance says that only arbitrators can appear in, uh, only lawyers uh, in Sabah can appear in arbitrations. Lawyers from West Malaysia cannot appear in arbitrations in Sabah. But I, I don't think so. There's a restriction to other lawyers uh, in Sabah. I'm not sure. So there was this, actually this difficulty that uh, basically if you wanted to have a arbitration in Sabah, you want to seat it in Sabah, uh, you will have to hire a Sabah lawyer, even if you are a Malaysian company to represent you. But even the job is, let's say, done through the Malaysian company in, let's say, a contractor is uh, in Kuala Lumpur or in Johor. Uh, so basically, uh, I think uh, uh, this became restrictive. Uh, I think the earlier decision in Zubli Muhiba uh, against the government of Malaysia uh, had really held that parties that uh, can be represented by a representative of its choice. Uh, so I think now the new act provides, unless otherwise agreed by the parties, the party to our arbitral proceedings may be represented in the proceedings by any representative appointed by the party. This provision follows the Singapore Act, word for word. So in Singapore, anybody can go in, but here it really means, it doesn't mean basically only lawyers can represent. It could be anybody, it could be an engineer, it could be anybody, it could be Akao, Achong, you know, or, you know, Ali, Ahmad, or Ramu, you know. So just be basically the representation now is wide. It is, you can bring somebody from overseas, you can bring somebody, but subject of course lah, to the Legal Profession Act that you cannot actually uh, appear in court. Uh, so I think that was the next, uh, okay, next one. Uh, arbitrability, the court's powers in deciding arbitrability of the matter. Uh, basically, we added one more provision is that uh, it is not capable of settlement by arbitration. That is the provision that was actually the, the public policy uh, arrangement. The, before that, it was contrary to public policy, stops there. What is public policy? Then we added this particular thing to make it clear and tie back to the model law or subject matter of the dispute is not capable of settlement by arbitration under the laws of Malaysia. For example, criminal law. It is something by the state. And let's say Malaysia makes a law. Let's say particular items cannot be arbitrated. We have to follow that law. Okay, so I think this is following the model law, uh, which is something that uh, for parties uh, to know that they are, they are whatever dispute they have uh, is then um, decided. And this, this final decision goes back to the court. It is the court that decides whether the arbitrability of matter is based on the commonly standard is amendment with the New York Convention and also Section 39 of the Act cannot be enforced. Actually, it's for more for enforcement. Uh, so we are tying back with the New York Convention and the model law. Next one. Section 9. I said now basically is that uh, I, we don't... How many people have fax machines uh, or have ever seen a fax machine? If you are new... Uh, practitioner, you have never seen a fax machine. I guarantee you have never seen a telex machine. <laughs> we all have seen telex. We have seen fax. Now we have seen fax gone out of fashion. Now what we have is email, Google Drive, <laughs> Dropbox. You see this difference. So we the, the, the act actually is following that. Basically, it's, and now it says arbitration agreement is extensive. Now arbitration agreement can be in writing, which is most important. It, as long as it's recorded in any form, whether or not arbitration agreement or contract has been concluded orally by the conduct or by other means, it can be in the exchange of submissions of claim and defense. This is the Bauer case. Huh? Uh, and then in which the existence of an agreement is alleged by one party, not denied by the other. Then this in writing is met 
by any electronic communication that parties make by means of data message, if the information contained is accessible, that means you must be able to actually extract it and, and usable for subsequent reference. And data message, we have described it as information generated, sent, stored by electronic, magnetic, optical, or similar means, and including not limited to electronic data interchange, uh, electronic mail, telegram, telex, and telecopy. So it's very, very wide. As long as you can actually, be, I think it can be even WhatsApp. An arbitration okay. agreement now can be in WhatsApp as long as you can take a screenshot <laughs> and show <Yeah>. it. <laughs> so I tell you, this is, uh, I mean, we, are, we have gone basically make it very easy already now. Uh, so we move on to the next one. So this is actually also uh, in, in, in the 2006 uh, provision. Next one. I'm going faster now to try to finish. Now, interim measures, section 11, section 19, section 19A and 19J. Now, interim measures is one of the most important things nowadays in international arbitration. Uh, parties are using more and more. Basically, the main problem coming from interim measures is about um, basically dissipation of assets. Sometimes you want also to, uh, to, 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 to preserve the assets. Sometimes you want to get discovery orders. Sometimes you want to get all the things that you require in court is now can be done in arbitration, basically. And it can be done cross-border. That's the difference. It is not just enough. But basically, I think the important thing is that you must show a course of action. Uh, there must be an arbitration agreement. The relief sort must be interim in nature. Uh, this relief, the interim relief must be to support, assist, aid or facilitate the proposed arbitration proceedings. And then this relief, this arbitration and arbitration proceedings after that relief has been given must be started within a reasonable time. So you can see how the, 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 the system works now. It is a very, very modern, very efficient. You can do anything with it. Uh, you cannot actually jam it. Uh, it's very difficult to jam it because you can get interim orders to stop it. Uh, so whatever the court can do. So interim orders is temporary relief given to a party to protect its rights in anticipation of a final resolution of the matter. In any case, prior to the final award being handed down. And that could be particular, uh, usually particular circumstances that give need to this rise uh, prior to this ultimate thing. So I think that is the, now I'm going to section 30. Now section 30 is actually a major change. Uh, why I say it's a major change, it goes beyond Malaysian law. Uh, so, you know, uh, when we started the 2005 act, I did mention to you all, uh, we followed the Indian provision. The Indian provision, I don't know how you, but the Indian provision crept, crept into the 2000, it was not in the Bar Council uh, 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 draft. Uh, basically it says where, where uh, domestic arbitration is concerned, you must decide according to Malaysian law. International arbitration, they can choose whatever law. But then we, we, we thought that, let's say, you know, if you look at many of the insurance uh, agreements that you have, people are referring in the agreement to English law because English law is more up to date and the courts decide the thing in accordance to that law, you know, so they have no problem. So I think the major amendment that we first did in 2011 to change the differentiation, they can decide in accordance to law. Then we suddenly realized law is a very ambiguous word. Eh? <laughs> I see it's strange, you know, we all thought we all know what law is, but law is actually very ambiguous. Law can be a white thing. And then, you know, you say Malaysian law, what, then, then we say suddenly we have what is called, uh, 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 what is that, um, uh, uh, UN created law, you know, what, what, what do they call it? Uh, uh, um, there's a uni, what uni comma, is that uni comma, something like that which is basically commercial uh, law issued by UNCITRAL. And a lot of institutions, are, uh, people are using that to govern their, their, their thing. They have, a, they, have an, they have a law, which is, uh, I, can't, I can't remember what it is, but people are actually creating rules of law. 
So what we decided, if parties have decided they want to use a particular rules of law, then the arbitral tribunal must follow that. So I think this is the major change. And we just fell in, in line very clearly with all the advanced, so-called advanced jurisdictions, allowing parties to choose the rule of law and the arbitral tribunal must follow it. So there is no provision in the law itself to say that you must follow this particular law. It is the parties to choose the rule of law. So in their contract, they say, I want this particular provision to be decided in accordance to the rules of Argentinian law. Then you have to follow arbitral tribunal must know about Argentina. Well, of course, guided by the parties, they will decide in accordance to Argentinian law. The other provision that has come up is I did mention earlier that uh, the arbitral tribunal in 4A, which is a new provision, uh, is shall decide according to equity conscience if only the parties have expressly authorized it to do so. Mac, Lex Mercatoria must be actually expressly um, provided for. So if they say, I want to follow the business arrangements and not the law, the conduct, how we have been conducting ourselves, and this is the way we want the arbitral tribunal to decide, then they have to actually provide for it and they must agree for it. And the arbitral tribunal can then apply that. So basically the provision, you must, must still follow the rules of law that parties have chosen. You can choose any other system provided the parties agree to it. I think making it simple for you all to understand. Okay, I think that's the, the, the provision on equity. I'm trying to go, how many more minutes? Eh? Oh, then we can go for questions. Now. now we come back to the next item on interest. This is where the, the, the original problem started, isn't it? The original problem started with the case in the federal court. So that is now dealt with, dealt with. So all the arbitral legislation in all the prominent international arbitral jurisdictions have similar kinds of provision. We have followed the same. And then basically we have come and move to the next one. Uh, this is the provision. Section 33, six, subject to subsection eight, unless otherwise agreed by the parties, the arbitral tribunal may, discretionary, eh, in the arbitral proceedings before it, award simple or compound interest. There was no provision earlier in the act for compound interest. That there means interest upon interest. Then from such date at such rate, at such rest as the arbitral tribunal considers appropriate for any period ending not later than the date of payment of the whole or part of it, a sum awarded by the arbitral tribunal in the arbitral proceedings, a sum which is an issue in the arbitral proceedings, but paid before the date of the award, costs awarded or ordered by the arbitral tribunal in arbitral proceedings, nothing in subsection six shall affect any other power of the arbitral tribunal to award interest. You can see uh, it is a very wide power, but the power has to be exercised in a judicial manner. So it has a discretion that must be exercised judicially. So I think that is the real test. So if you decide to give uh, interest upon interest, compound interest, you must explain why you're doing it. So most arbitrators will not do it. Uh, <laughs> because to explain why you do it must, must have cogent reasons. I, I think for all of us will follow, normally we follow the court way. Uh, they say 5% civil law act, uh, the practice procedure says this, then we will follow that for Malaysia. Uh, but in international arbitrations, I've seen, we have issued uh, based on uh, base lending rate, you know, base lending rate of a, of, 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 of a leading bank or a currency, uh, packed currency for provision, especially when there are foreign currency involved. So the last one, eight, uh, eight let me read out the last one. The, uh, when award directs a sum to be paid, the sum shall, unless the award otherwise directs, carry interest from the date of the award and the same rate as a judgment debt, at the same rate as a judgment debt. So post award interest will be at the judgment debt. So I think it's caught also. Uh, uh, 
Oh, I'm, I'm speaking too loudly, is it? Slowly. Slowly, okay, okay. I'm too fast, is it? Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, next one. Uh, it is important because, you know, why we become a normal... Arbitration becomes uh, attractive. Uh, because what you can get in arbitration, you can get in court. What you can get in court, you can get in arbitration. So, I mean, uh, and then you get all the other advantages of arbitration, uh, which is actually finality. With these new uh, amendments, arbitration really means uh, there's a high probability that what is well written, it cannot be set aside and dealt with. So I think that is very important. The next provision, can we go on? The changer. Uh, I did mention this, isn't it? Huh? I did mention one of the great advantages of arbitration is confidentiality. Of course, there's an issue of confidentiality, privacy, transparency. Now, when you talk about confidentiality, is things are keeping uh, confidential. That means not made known to third parties. Private is when you're holding the hearing, you are actually sitting in a room, nobody else can come in. That is privacy. Transparency is the right to know so that the proceedings can be understood and justified. So the problem basically is that arbitration is now balancing with these three things. But I think the transparency issue only comes up in what is called investment state arbitrations, where the arbitration is against a state by companies and individuals, and it's taxpayers' money involved. So the issue of transparency has become an issue there. So they say, for example, if you remember the, the Australian case of uh, Plowman, uh, SO versus Plowman, uh, the High Court of Australia ruled that uh, there cannot be confidentiality in uh, arbitration because in this case, uh, the people have a right to know of the expert report of Dr. Julian Liu because, because Dr. Julian Liu was actually dealing with the issue of uh, public utilities. You know, the cost of buying gas from SO and is being charged to the taxpayers to produce electricity and it's affecting the electricity tariff price. So that dispute, although there's a dispute between uh, the, 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 the parties, that dispute has an impingement on public interest. So it legitimate public interest. So transparency is an issue with that. But confidentiality and privacy is for international commercial arbitration, there's no argument. Business people want their data linen not to be aired. When they have a quarrel, they want it to be quietly settled, enforceable. I think the biggest uh, breaches of confidentiality is now going on is, I think, uh, reporting, uh, reporting of arbitral awards and all these things. Other than that, you hardly hear of it. Uh, and then I think this, this new provision actually uh, makes it in statute form. So if you go, Section 41A, Unless otherwise agreed by the parties, no party may publish, disclose, or communicate any information relating to arbitral proceedings under arbitration agreement or an award made in those arbitral proceedings. So I think that is quite clear. Nothing in the subsection can prevent, shall prevent the publication, disclosure, or communication of information referred to in that subsection by a party if the publication, disclosure, and communication is made to protect or pursue a legal right or interest of the party, that means you file a matter in court, you have a right. Uh, then to, to enforce or challenge an award uh, referred to in this subsection. If you want to actually enforce the award, you, of course you have to tell what is the award. <laughs> you have to tell the court at least that, or, and that court actually will actually, papers in the courts are actually now public documents, isn't it? Uh, so every, in fact, I think now with the e-filing and all these things, you can actually search and get all the documents out, uh, even without uh, uh, doing a search. In like the old days, we used to search the registry. <laughs> you know, it costs too much money. Uh, in the legal proceedings before the court or any judicial authority in or outside of Malaysia. And if B, if the publication, disclosure, or communication is made to any government body, 
regulatory body, court or tribunal, the party is obliged by law to make a publication or disclosure or communication. For example, if you have, let's say, a file claim, file, if you're a public listed company, you have a large claim filed against you, you have to make a BUSA order. You have to inform BUSA, isn't it? And you have to actually disclose. And let's say if you've got an adverse uh, arbitration against you and that becomes a contingent liability, you still have to report. So all these things, I think, uh, are allowed by law. And then see, uh, the, the, the publication, disclosure, and communication is made to a professional or any other advisor of any of the parties. So you can actually have tell your advisors because that means you can tell your lawyers, you can tell your experts, you can tell your, uh, your claim consultants uh, the information that you have. Uh, so I think that this, this is important. Then, uh, then section 40... 1B, uh, this is the one that I think a lot of people not uh, subject to subsection 2 of the court proceedings under this act are to be heard otherwise than in open court. What does it mean? It's supposed to be heard in camera. The default position where arbitration matters are concerned has to be heard in camera. Notwithstanding subsection 1, the court may order those proceedings to be heard in open court on application of any party. So party must make an application or in any particular case, the court itself is satisfied that these proceedings are ought to be heard in open court. And any order under this subsection by the court is final, cannot be challenged. Interesting, huh? I don't think so. Anybody has uh, realized this, you know, that basically when it comes to arbitration, it, it, the court has to make an order that it is satisfied that it has to be for public good, it has to be heard in, a, uh, in, a, in open court. Otherwise, it has to be heard in chambers or it has to be heard in camera. That means you have to clear the public gallery. <laughs> so, <laughs> so interesting. As I say, it's quite... Uh, so I think it's clear. Now, all arbitration proceedings in Malaysia, Malaysian seated arbitration proceedings are confidentially confidential unless the parties agree otherwise. And then this is actually part of the safe seat principles. Huh? Next one. Section 42. Uh, I, I think I've explained this earlier, but uh, this has been the controversial section uh, when, uh, when the, this was the second point that was raised by the Bar Council that the, this should be actually amended or repealed, uh, this section 42. And then the government and uh, the agreement that it was repealed. Uh, of course, uh, I think uh, a lot of people say, oh, how can you repeal this? You know, uh, it, it is, uh, it's a provision that is actually uh, giving us a, a, a way to check the, 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 the arbitral tribunal so it doesn't make mistakes and all these things in the award. Uh, but I think the provision is making mistakes and other things will be basically procedural and uh, this thing. And you have to go to section 37 to set aside the award. So now with the removal of section 42, arbitral awards essentially become uh, final subject to 37 and 38, setting aside all enforcement. So I think this is uh, something that is very important because uh, arbitration is no more like litigation. It is different from litigation. Once you choose the tribunal, that's why it's very important to choose the tribunal carefully and you make sure the tribunal gives you an enforceable award, it ends there. So for business people, we think, I mean, people accept that internationally. In fact, most jurisdictions, as I pointed out, only England, Singapore, uh, New Zealand, Hong Kong doesn't have it already anymore. I, I don't know, I think maybe Australia has this, maybe Australia, I think doesn't have. But the, the thing is that it's very few jurisdictions and it's hardly used. The reason why it's hardly used because of the threshold test. They cannot meet the threshold of this point is a very important point or, you know, uh, and it, it cannot be mere error on the face of the award, the Ganda oil uh, decision, uh, bringing back error on the face of the award uh, back into a modern regime doesn't work anymore. So I think this is against modern law. And this is why this, this provision, I think Malaysian lawyers at one point, they were all very uncomfortable, but I suppose it's more to do with, they are so used to getting an appeal situation all the way to the federal court. Uh, they cannot say that uh, that we will actually do our work very well, choose our tribunal well, 
get a final decision and live by it because uh, this is what is happening everywhere else. Uh, so I think uh, this is uh, uh, a, an important change. Uh, although it, uh, uh, they, 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 some people are not very happy with it, but this is already done. Uh, some people say they want to bring it back. You know, I think it's a regression if you want to bring it back. But after all, if, if it's going to be brought back, it will be by the Bar Council again. You know, So you have to say that the original uh, request to actually amend or repeal it was actually wrong. Uh, that it was actually, uh, some, somebody have to admit uh, that what we did was wrong. But you know, but I just have to go back with that. Okay, we go to the next one. I think this is done. I've explained that. Uh, section 43 is actually uh, uh, a consequential section from section 42 on uh, what will happen by the court when you when you have that provision working. Uh, so that is also repealed together. Uh, I think this is the turning point. Uh, the, it's the bar council that asked for this repeal uh, and or amendment. And uh, so the, 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 in fact that, as you can see in the letter, was uh, a request that was made urgently. Uh, it was made urgently. In fact, that was the impetus. In fact, we all worked very, very hard to get all these things going. And we have become, I think, that the major change, except I said, you know, for third party funding, other than that, we are okay. Uh, but I hope one day we'll get third party funding. Maybe uh, Hong Kong is talking about um, litig uh, uh, litigation funding. Can we move to the conclusion now? I've already explained all the things. Huh? Okay, I think 42, let's go back again. Let me uh, support. Uh, repeal is 42. The move, move, uh, okay, first, it is not in line with model law. So it undermines the principles of finality of the awards and minimum court intervention. In fact, most of the court intervention was in section 42 and, and the courts were trying very valiantly, trying to fence ring, ring fence the thing until the federal court said there is no ring fence. There cannot be ring fence because the words are very clear. You can ask for any question of law. Then it also created a concurrent jurisdiction between section 42 and section 47. There were two sections that actually say you can set aside an award. So that became very confusing. Uh, and the, the, the tests that were used were different and they were overlapping. And then I think a lot of people were starting to use section 42 uh, to delay, to delay procedural abuse, you know, it just, uh, and then I think uh, after uh, the, the federal court decision, uh, the, the real, real fear was floodgates. That means there is no more arbitration in Malaysia because every arbitration award is that of an of a, of a inferior tribunal subject to appeal all the way. So I think then there's no finality already. So you see, if it's been set aside or it's going through, how are you going to actually uh, uh, enforce? Let's say in Malaysia, you can't enforce in Malaysia. If you can go and overseas, you can enforce. But most of the things, if you seated the thing there, you may want to enforce in Malaysia because some of the assets are here. And then I think it's a policy consideration. I think the uh, main thing is that I think that that time the government wanted to increase the number of cases, uh, especially international cases. There's no difference between international and domestic. And skill sets change because Arbitrators who sit in domestic arbitrations or international arbitrations have to be behave the same. Have to behave the same and have the highest standard of ability and work. And then, uh, and also uh, section 42, uh, if you know a lot of companies, although they're called domestic, they are sometimes international entities incorporated domestically. So they may have problems and they may be an obligation, treaty obligation problem under New York Convention. Uh, I think it, it was the threshold uh, was there. Maybe perhaps it would have been uh, ameliorated, but it was not there. So I think the, the difficulty is that. So, okay, I think that is done. Uh, going to conclusion now, I think I've got 15 minutes at least. In conclusion, the 2018 amendment, I think is progressive. Uh, we started to move ahead and fell in line with many of our neighbors and the more uh, advanced and progressive ju jurisdictions. And particularly, I think it's Singapore, Hong Kong, 
and uh, I think uh, uh, the some of the the ICC London, uh, you know, uh, yeah, Paris, uh, and I think we are we became one of the model law model countries finding a middle way except for third party funding, but uh, other than that we are there. It was meant to boost the economy, uh, so our ranking in the uh, global competitive report, uh, we should actually done better. In fact, when the center was doing better, uh, our ranking was very high, and then it started to drop again. Uh, then I think the most important thing is that the jurisdiction of the court is not affected. The court has still the same power, uh, and then there is actually an enhancement, especially of the jurisdiction of the courts in interim measures together with the arbitral tribunal. So I think that in conclusion will give you a summary of all the uh, work that I've, uh, uh, I've talked about that was done in 2018 to bring us up to date. I think at that year also, we amended the, the uh, uh, AIAC arbitration rules to bring it to the 2018 rules. So if you want a more detailed uh, discussion, so you can look at my article for those who have access on repeal of section 42, I will detail discussion under MLJ 2019, 6, uh, MLJ, uh, CI, uh, C14, uh, C14, C4, and then uh, it's not the bomb. <laughs> 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 and then um, arbitration and its development in Malaysia, just giving an overview, which is this talk about. And then, uh, of course, uh, for those who cannot sleep at night, you can then read my book <laughs> to get a more deeper understanding, you know, because I didn't sleep many nights writing the book. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, uh, Richard. And I have finished, you know, I think uh, I'm ready to take questions or any other thing that you deem yeah. appropriate. Eh? I have two questions, Dato. Uh, thank you, Dato, for your uh, presentation. Uh, with the 2018 amendment, uh, we see some form of uh, no finality of uh, decision making, you know, uh, back to the arbitrator. So do you think this is uh, suf sufficient? Uh, by just uh, repealing the uh, section 42 and 43. Is this sufficient or do you think it should be more? I, I think it is sufficient because we are in line with model law. Model law suggests this is the regime that should be. Uh, by, by, by actually repealing section 42, we are focusing the party's minds to actually focus on the arbitration and to the presentation before the arbitration and look at the arbitral award and make sure that the work, the choice of the arbitral tribunal, the, the, the presentation to the arbitral tribunal and the award by the arbitral tribunal is paramount. Uh, that becomes the issue. You don't actually have a plan basically that you will second guess uh, and allow the court to reinterpret what has been actually relitigate the arbitration award. Lah. So I, that is an improvement. I, I, I believe that uh, that is the way to go if we are serious about arbitration being a parallel private dispute resolution system, uh, which is enforceable around the world. Because the standards have to be worldwide. So our arbitral awards that come out must be able to enforce it in the 166 countries. There should not be a problem. So that's why I think uh, I've been focusing a lot on training, writing awards, uh, conducting how to conduct an arbitration, how to make decisions, how to do procedural orders. All these things are skill sets that arbitrators must have. Uh, so I think we need to train arbitrators. Uh, no more that just because you got gray hair or no hair that you become an arbitrator. It is more to do with, uh, with skill sets, uh, with knowledge and uh, temperament and ability to actually deliver an enforceable award. Okay, thank you, Dato. Uh, another question, probably the last question. All right, uh, Dato, what do you see the future development of the arbitration agreement in light of the Electronic Commerce Act as well as the Digital Signature Act? Uh, you mentioned that the uh, agreement can be, you know, concluded maybe by WhatsApp, email. So does it, uh, uh, are we moving uh, uh, to, towards the, you know, electronic uh, agreement? What I, do you I, see that uh, this could happen? 
we we I, the old days of uh, of uh, having a bound contract <laughs> and uh, you know put into the into your thing nobody looks at it until they have a dispute may not be the everything now will be actually uh, pdf copies uh, soft copies uh, cut and paste uh, you know and maybe even a, a, a exchange of uh, communication uh, the exchange of communication could be oral uh, people talking in meetings and then recorded in some written form uh, and then exchange you know so uh, i i think it it all fits in with the modern situation including uh, the two x that you actually referred to so we should not have any problems we are ready i okay. i believe that we are up to date uh, we should not have any issues uh, because the definitions are sufficiently wide sufficiently broad uh, and more importantly i think it's uh, it is uh, on point with where what is happening around the world uh, e-commerce is, is a very big thing when you buy something you know they say please tick this box you know you're not going to get the sale <laughs> even before you pay you forgot to tick this box and most yeah. probably in that box goes there and then there is another agreement <laughs> and perhaps i i do think you know one of the things that we don't have here yet is class arbitration agreements you know? uh, so i'm waiting to see whether there will come a time where there will be class action coming into arbitration which is banned in many united states situation even arbitration they ban into uh, not having class action you know? so we see how far i can see one direction is moving there because as you pointed out uh, richard earlier uh, in this uh, in this when we started this that uh, people are aware of their rights eh? people are more conscious of it yes. people want to actually exercise it and uh, we we should uh, we should facilitate it eh? uh, because we are here to resolve and smoothen the economy so it can continue growing eh? right okay thank you uh, due to time constraint um Uh, probably dato do you have any golden advice to the young lawyers who are passionate to you know uh, venture into arbitration and into this this area any, any advice that you want to share with the audience especially the pupils and the uh, junior lawyers uh, i i believe that it is actually a very uh, good field to choose uh, you will learn so much there's a lot to learn but i think more importantly uh it is also quite rewarding because it is cross border uh you will have a chance to work if you work with a very busy practitioner not only going to court but also doing international arbitration you will find that the person will be actually uh doing cross border work different kinds of law different kinds of tribunals different kind of issues uh you know and you just enrich you uh that is i think the borderless world that we are going to get uh with the belt and road coming we do not actually uh we we should not lose that opportunity uh because uh I, while while they everyone will be speaking chinese uh, they are also having disputes you know? <laughs> they need yeah. to resolve disputes they will speak in chinese but it's still a dispute to be resolved by arbitrators arbitral practitioners uh you know they need to know the law they need to actually enforce because they are doing contracts at the end of it is the contracts don't change the work has to be done by procurement by uh, uh executing the contract payment and all these things come in but now i think many many fields are coming you know the other day i just saw arbitration of art Said, what is it <laughs> then i saw my friend there samir shah okay. samir shah is saying i i'm doing arbitration of art that means uh, he's actually getting involved in the sale uh, purchase you know i mean auctions and all these things are art artifacts you know so I, i can see it just growing you know it, uh, and and you know their uh, arbitration is quite wide you can see for example there is such thing called domain name if you are into ip into uh, let's say uh, 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 electronic uh, uh, intellectual property and uh, electronic uh, uh kind of uh, websites and all these things you can actually just do a uh, 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 domain name arbitration which is one of the fastest growing arbitration procedure although it's it's a misnomer to call it arbitration it's actually a, a tribunal but it is accepted as an arbitral procedure so there are many specialized you got investment arbitration you got maritime arbitration you got sports arbitration 
you got uh, you got construction arbitration, you got normal commercial arbitration, anything you name, there is actually can be resolved by arbitration. In fact, now they are talking about even software. I remember we were talking about software. Some of the software you cannot go to a judge to hear that 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 software thing because you may want to have technical people hearing it, but deciding in accordance to the law and the contract. So uh, I think that's important uh, also. And then now they allow you to decide according to trade practices. So you can even, uh, parties can actually structure the arbitral award in such a way that that can be also one of the requirements that the arbitral tribunal must look at, which will be submitted to them. This is how it was done. This is the way it was supposed to be done. Uh, this is the rules. Let's say these are the protocols that are supposed to be applied. Huh? So I, I think it's quite exciting. Uh, but young people, I think, you know, it, 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 it's just like anything else requires application. You just have to work. Uh, you have to understand. You have to read. Uh, I think uh, I, what I've done today for you all is basically take you through the act. You already know what it's all about. Eh? Uh, with the act, you can start off with the other thing. And then uh, if you, uh, you have a master or you have a, a, a practitioner, talk to the person or her. Uh, him or her, you know, you, and you get some valuable, uh, and maybe try to follow, uh, try to follow what they are doing, you know, and then you will, you will, nothing like uh, being there, being there doing it. Uh. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Dato, for your insightful sharing. I love uh, the Dato's uh, saying just now, just read the Arbitration Act and you suddenly will know the whole story. Uh, you <laughs> suddenly will know the whole story. Okay, that's, that's really, really good, Dato. <laughs> No, so uh, I think with that, I uh, just do my concluding remark. It is uh, my distinct honor to moderate Dato's talk today. And the Slango Bar would like to take this opportunity to thank Dato for his wonderful presentation. And with that, we uh, will end the session today. And uh, for, for all the audience, you may email to Wasanta to request for the material. All right. So thank you, everybody. And thank you, Heather He. She has been uh, talking to Miss Vasanta and thank you, Miss Vasanta from Slangoba, who has been work, working very hard to ensure the, the, the smooth running of today's talk. So okay. everyone, please stay safe and stay healthy and stay positive and test negative. That's the <laughs> word I learned. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye -bye. Thank, you, Vasanta. You. thank you, Richard. Thank you all. Thank you, Rato. All, all, See you. all the best, all the best. Uh, any, anything you can email me. You know, sure. I, I've got the email number. Uh, and then I want to thank my colleagues. Uh, there is actually Heather, Apri, and Jayasri here. Uh, I think they've been putting up with me. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dato. Bye. 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 Thank you, Kendi.